All right. Well, I want to welcome all of you to today's uh, advocacy training for 2022. Uh, it's so exciting to be with you today, and I'm so uh, honored and pleased that you're joining us um, both today and during Advocacy Month. It's such an important part of our mission that we as a community speak with a single united voice to Congress, um, because as I think all of you know, the Fulbright program is, ad, is uh, appropriated fully uh, every year. There is no endowment. There is no standing multiple year commitment to the Fulbright program if it is not ap appropriated fully and well each year, the program disappears. So therefore the work that you will be doing in the coming weeks, absolutely vital to the future of Fulbright, both uh, this year and for years to come. So thank you so much for, for helping us to, uh, to work together uh, to stand for Fulbright. Uh, I want to introduce um, my two co-hosts, or three co-hosts, really. Um, first is Sarah Donovan from Venable. Uh, Sarah, as well as Laura Naho uh, from Venable. The two of them are, are donating their time and expertise to us. They have been partners with us for many years. So, uh, Sarah, if you could say hello, and then Lauren, you go ahead, too. Hey, everyone. Glad to be with you all today. And Lauren, go ahead. And same with me. It's great to work with you again and continue to work with you and look forward to a great advocacy uh, training and advocacy month ahead. And finally, my colleague Fiona. Fiona is uh, working with our uh, government affairs interns to do all of the scheduling for this. So Fiona, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Very excited to... Um be able to share your meetings with you and get everyone prepared for this. Great. So let me talk a little bit uh, for a few minutes um, to set up this particular uh, training. Many of you, more than half of you, in fact, have done advocacy for Fulbright before. So this will, some of this will be old news, but we hope that those of you who are new to this will appreciate this. And the rest of you will just kind of um, get uh, a little warmed up and maybe a little bit of rust uh, knocked off. Um, we'll help you to prepare for this advocacy meeting. We'll talk about how to tell stories that emphasize the important impact of the Fulbright program. We'll talk about how to do an effective meeting. All of these will be done virtually on Zoom. There will be a couple of them that where the, the particular office will prefer to do it as a conference call and we'll let you know those details but for the most part it will be done on zoom how to follow up which is really important keeping and maintaining relationships is critical to the future of Fulbright we'll give you some information on the status of Fulbright in China and we'll do some practical steps uh, to uh, remember moving forward all right let me get this going. Okay. Um, how do you prepare? So preparing for these meetings is pretty straightforward. You'll want to go to the Fulbright.org website uh, and click here to the toolkit. You'll find that through the advocacy website. So you click on advocacy and you'll find the toolkit or you can go directly to this URL. You'll find our message to Congress, uh, frequently asked questions, the Fulbright effect for your state. So if you're from Connecticut or Nevada or wherever you are, you'll want to, to look for that particular report. And then for leaders, the leaders of these meetings, you'll want to complete a, a report form. Um, go ahead, uh, Fiona, and talk to them a little bit about how the next steps will take place. And we'll go back to this in a minute. Sure. Yeah. So we're in the final uh, stages right now of scheduling all these meetings uh, for you guys. So you'll be put into groups with uh, fellow Fulbrighters here on the call, and uh, you'll be meeting with these uh, congressional offices. Um, some of you will be assigned to your uh, particular uh, constituents, constituency. Um, we do our, we make a best effort to make sure that everyone is able to meet with the office uh, that represents them. Uh, will like be likely also that you'll be meeting with other congressional offices as well uh, within your group. 
So we're working through the final stages of making sure all of those are finalized. And in the coming days, we'll be sending you all an email with all of that information. Um, and we'll elaborate a little bit later in the presentation about what kind of information you can expect to get from us in the coming days when we uh, let you know your groups, uh, introduce you to each other, and give you an idea about when your meetings will be. Great, thank you, Fiona. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, give this over to Sarah first, and then Lauren to talk about the political context. Really important that our ask this year is done within the uh, current environment, politically and budgetarily. So, Sarah, go ahead and get us started. Sure, and I want Lauren. Um, I want the two of us to sort of talk about this together, have it look, be a little bit more of a discussion because I think. Here, what we're trying to um, convey is that obviously there's a lot of um, more press and more focus um, in international relations since the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So it's been on the front page of all the papers. There's this after, I think, a long period of time talking very, um, there's been a lot of talk in DC um, about um, domestic issues and um, focus on um, domestic manufacturing and um, how we're going to handle these various um, issues that have been coming up for the past two years, you know, like a very, very almost like nationalist viewpoint. Um, now we're talking a lot about our place in the world and uh, the United States uh, and diplomacy and how, you know, how this is all what you're going to be advocating for on the Hill with Fulbright, like how what you did as Fulbrighters and how the Fulbright program continues to play this very key and important role in how the U.S. interacts with the world. So obviously the war in Ukraine shows the importance of maintaining key alliances. I mean, NATO being one of them, but also these individual country relationships. Um, China continues to be a rival. I mean, we can't, Russia's, you know, the bad guy of the day, but really China continues to invest in its own, you know, diplomacy programs um, outside of the official, um, you know, network. And so we can't, we need to constantly remind members of Congress and staff that um, work on this of, of that fact. This isn't something that they think about every day. So it's not that it isn't important to them or they didn't know about it in the past. It's just sometimes we need to give them a little nudge and remind them of these investments that our adversaries are making and that we need to be competitive with them in terms of funding in order to be successful. So I think maybe with that, I'll let Lauren talk about the next two bullets and then we can um, just give you our, uh, you know, some additional thoughts. Sure. And um... The president just released his budget um, about a month ago, and it actually calls for a cut to the program. We were able to get the Fulbright up to 275 in the uh, fiscal year 2022. It was a million dollar increase from the 274 from the year before. However, it calls for a cut, which is the 268.3 million, which is where the appropriation um, committees in both the House and Senate that becomes their starting point. Um, so this is where all your work is going to be coming in and telling your stories and why these are important. So, and why the Fulbright is, a, is important because yes, Congress is focusing on Ukraine. Um, there's a China bill that they're going to be, uh, China competes bill that they're going to be putting together. But Fulbright is a very important part of all of that because uh, you're going to hear um, people in the Department of Defense say diplomacy having effective diplomacy programs makes their job much easier um, it has a u.s presence around the world so they everyone feels it's important we're just competing with some other um, needs that congress may be focused on however your stories your importance and the impact you had in the countries you served in and raising the u.s profile there is so important on there and um and then also um the last one is Fulbright is by um, nonpartisan. We we want to, we need to work with both parties. Uh, we've done that over the years. It's a uh, everyone comes from different backgrounds, and as you've seen over the years, the parties in power in the House and Senate flip. It very likely, definitely, the House 
they will probably flip to the Republicans. So we need allies on both sides. You don't want to go in on a very partisan note because if you, um, because we need allies from both sides of the aisle. Yeah, let me talk a little bit about um, do's and don'ts and more specificity a little bit later in the program. But I think what we want to convey to you is as at, working with Fiona and John at Fulbright Association, that as federal lobbyists, we've taken into consideration the current political environment, what could happen in the next Congress, and that the messages included in this, and including with the training today, are with all of that in mind. So we're setting the Fulbright, you know, Fulbright alumni up for success when we're talking about the messages that you're going to be going in um, to the offices with. One final note that I would add is that uh, an argument we're going to be making is that the Fulbright program for 75 years has been foundational to the kinds of alliances uh, that we are now benefiting from when it comes to dealing with Russia. So when you're talking about our friendship, ongoing friendship with, uh, with Britain, with France, with Germany, et cetera, uh, what is, how, how do we build those things the Fulbright program contributes to ongoing alliances as well as uh, strategic uh, um, uh, relationships. So let me talk a little bit about our ask. Um, this is a dramatic increase that we are requesting from Congress this year to go from the 275 that Lauren just made reference to, to $403 million. That's a dramatic increase, and you need to be prepared for uh, justifying that. Uh, there, uh, we, we've listed here important arguments uh, for uh, that increase to energize diplomatic leadership, to strengthen our alliances with 49 countries, to restore leadership ceded to China. That's an important strategic advantage and one that uh, it resonates with both parties exceptionally well, and then to widen the global reach of, uh, of the Fulbright program and critically to engage alumni worldwide. So this, uh, this is a, a significant step forward financially, and we're uh, looking to you to help make that argument. We'll be asking you to tell stories. This is important. The role that you will be playing for the most part in these meetings is to tell your Fulbright story of impact. And you'll want to think about how to demonstrate that Fulbright is an effective investment for America. These are the three main points. These will sound familiar to you because if you advocated last year, this is exactly what we made the argument last year. It strengthens national security. It brings resources to the United States, half of the Fulbright program is spent here in the United States, which is something many members of Congress do not fully understand. And it has a lasting impact through uh, alumni like you and me. Tell your stories. This is really very important. As I've just mentioned, you'll wanna think very clearly about what story you want to tell to illustrate these points. You'll want that story to be nice and tight and not uh, rambling on and on, but it makes some very specific points. In what specific ways did you build goodwill and respect while overseas? So for example, you might tell the story of visiting a village in a rural area of this country that doesn't usually get uh, visitors from the United States. You, maybe you were a teacher, maybe you were a scholar, and maybe you brought uh, information to that community that had never been there before. You don't want to speak in generalities. In this case, you really want to tell a specific story. What impact have you seen here in the United States? Now, you may not have a story for this. It's okay. You don't, your stories don't have to illustrate all of these points. But if you've worked with a visiting Fulbrighter here in the United States, that's a good way to do it. Uh, what specific ways has Fulbright had an impact on your life and career? So this is part of the investment argument. The United States pays for these uh, grants for Americans, and there's a payoff uh, years and years that follow. So your career 
and your community service, your public service makes a difference. And finally, how have you maintained the network you started as a Fulbrighter? That those relationships matter. So if you can tell the story of how you've maintained a friendship or uh, a, a research collaboration with someone overseas, that makes a big difference. Right, and I'm just gonna echo John as I used to work been a Hill staffer and those personal stories really resonate on there. You're gonna hear about the funding program. We're gonna have the, the sheet that says all those that do, but the staffers are gonna have a range as most of you have, have done these before of probably next to zero knowledge about the program and, and some that have, are really familiar with it. But having those impact stories that are specific to you, you become the face of Fulbright to that particular office and your experience there. So that's why be so specific and, and the impact on you have is very important and will really resonate with that office. So here I'm gonna open the conversation to both Lauren and Sarah as we talk Hi. about uh, the, uh, the, again, the benefits of the Fulbright program uh, uh, to the United States and to the world. So the Fulbright program builds strategic relationships, as we mentioned, all of those interconnected uh, uh, dimensions, very important. As we, again, as we look at the conflict in Ukraine, uh, all of those relationships are uh, important to, um, to the United States and to the world generally. Uh, U.S. ambassadors tell us over and over again that the Fulbright program is a crucial diplomatic tool. This has been true in both Republican and Democratic administrations. A strong support from a politically appointed uh, ambassadors as well as career diplomats. Um, the program develops U.S. friendly leaders. One of the things that you can think about is there, there are currently three heads of state who are uh, Fulbrighters, uh, hundreds of mid-level um, uh, and high-level ministers um, and, and others who make decisions on foreign policy that affect the United States. Most of the ministers at a high level in Vietnam a former mortal enemy of the United States are Fulbrighters. It's a powerful point to make. Um, and finally, visiting Fulbrighters are critically important to our national security because they teach languages that otherwise would not be uh, available uh, to co uh, colleges and universities across the United States. Okay, so let's talk a little, uh, uh, actually, before we go on with that, uh, Sarah or Lauren, did you wanna add uh, anything to that, to those points? No, I think, I think to Lauren's point earlier that I think you'll find in both um, Republican and Democratic offices that this sort of messaging will resonate. Um, and what he said about um, it supporting, um, you know, our, the money that we spend um, over in the Pentagon and the defense um, arena, that this, this is um, an enhancement to that, but also it really, um, it, it's, it's, I feel like I'm talking to people that know this better than I do, but I feel I just want to state sort of the obvious, like, the work that the Fulbright program does and the work that you all did um, is supportive of both what we do from a defense perspective, but then also from a diplomacy perspective. And I think sharing your stories about how, um, how you were a part of that is going to be very powerful. Um, but letting them know these basic facts about the program is also um, an important tool um, during these meetings as well. Like Lauren said, there's going to be varying levels of um, understanding of how it operates, what it does, 
um, those sorts of things. So perhaps asking them during the meeting, maybe towards the beginning about their level of familiarity with the program might be helpful and, and how detailed you go versus more of a general overview. But I think all of these things are great things to mention to offices, no matter who you're meeting with. And just one other point I just want to add to that is there is there is an interest on, on the Hill on both sides of the aisle. There's concern about what other countries' views of, of America are. And, and the Fulbrighters really are become face of America in a lot of these countries. They may not have access to media or, you know, free media where they get the whole story. They, you, be, um, you become the face of America and all the good that America can do in a, on those alliances that there. So it's so important that for Congress to know the, as I mentioned, the impact and the diplomacy and, and essentially a lot of these countries that you have worked in and done these projects are, and you become the ambassador to the United States in that area. Most of the people that you work with are not going to know the U.S. ambassador. That's at the very high level, but you're probably doing the most important work is on the interacting with the uh, the citizens in that country, doing great work, collaborating on these projects, and you and the work they do reflect the good the good of America and the best of America. That's well, put, that's well put, Lauren. And, and I would add to that, therefore, that numbers matter. So one of the reasons why we're asking for an increase in funding is to frankly increase the number of Fulbrighters who can be out there. Because uh, each of us, were, we were only able to see and meet and work with a limited number of people. But if you increase the number of people who are doing that, meaning the number of Fulbrighters who are overseas, especially, the kind of impact that Lauren just described grows proportionally. So if you have 100 Fulbrighters in the country, that's great. But if you have 120 or 150, that's even better. They can uh, touch more people and have a greater impact, uh, therefore. Let's talk about the meeting itself. Again, many of you have already experienced this, so this may be a bit routine for you. Of course, you'll want to start the meeting by introducing yourself. Where do you live? Who you are? What, uh, what, what, where you did your Fulbright? What do you do now? Remind them that you're there representing the Fulbright Association, which is independent from the State Department. It's important that you are speaking as an alum rather than as some agent of the State Department, which you are not. Thank them for their support. Uh, even if you don't know well their voting record, don't worry about that. Just thank them for the support that they give um, and explain that you're there as a resource to them to help them better understand the program and uh, to understand why it is we're making this request. That's one of the reasons why Lauren made mention of Find, trying to find out what they know about the Fulbright program so you're not repeating something they already know that they're going to something new and always your stories will make a difference. Okay, here we wanna dig into the ask a little bit more deeply. As mentioned earlier, we're asking for a significant increase, $128 million increase from the current level of funding. Um, now, there are two pieces to this. And it's important that you understand these two pieces. The first is to restore the program to the level it was 12 years ago. So we have been experiencing flat funding for 12 years. That's a very important message to share with folks on Capitol Hill. Uh, if we were just to get to that level based on inflation, we would want the program to be funded at 363 million. So the lion's share of this increase is to get the program back to where it was, to restore it. The second piece is an additional $40 million. That $40 million is designed to strengthen the program into the future, okay? So here are some of the arguments there, and I'll ask Lauren and then Sarah to, to add to this. Um, the first is that the program needs to meet today's challenges. Without strong funding, it just can't do that. 
So there are challenges to uh, our leadership globally, thanks to the fact that the Chinese have invested in these kinds of programs at fantastically high levels. There are challenges around the situation with Russia, where we're trying to build and maintain our friendships around the world. That's critically important. And the pandemic itself has really been uh, quite damaging to the Fulbright program. It takes a lot more resources to administer. There are testing uh, that has to be done. It's very complicated. And without new resources, the program cannot meet these challenges. The second point I'd make is it's a highly efficient way to advance American interests. So uh, again, this payoff of alumni year after year after year, this is an investment that pays off again and again, highly efficient, highly um, uh, accountable. This is a good use of taxpayer dollars. Um, and then uh, it will increase the grant size. So in other words, um, we're having difficulty attracting people on a practical level to accept Fulbright grants because their value in real terms has declined over time. They can't afford to do a Fulbright. You would think you would do that automatically, but it's, very, it's not easy once you do uh, the budget on this. We'll want to increase our um, ability to uh, attract and, and bring in um, more diverse candidates. Uh, that requires uh, outreach and work and investment that needs to be done with these monies. And finally, to uh, magnify alumni impact. Um, uh, not If you want to take advantage of this network of alumni, you need to invest in it. So Lauren, if you could add any texture to this, same with you, Sarah, that would be great. Yeah, sure thing. And, and the reason we, we selected um, why the additional 40 million on top of that is because as John mentioned, these are things that we need to deal with also now. Uh, we've, we've lost a lot of the value due to inflation. So that's why this 363, but the 403 ask is gonna be to deal with some of these current environment we are because the first question you're gonna have is from staff is like, oh, wow, that's a big increase. What are you gonna do with this? So the message is gonna be saying, this program has been flat funded, which has decreased value of the program. And we want to even increase it more because what we're finding is we're not able to, there are certain candidates that would be fantastic, but because of the, uh, the uh, fin their financial um, situation, they may not be able to do the program because the value of the grant has decreased. And then we're using a lot of things that Congress is very focused on on there is and it's because of the concern on Russia. So we want to, with the diplomacy, work in these countries so that we're um, through an efficient way through the Fulbright program, we are actually um, producing goodwill for America that are gonna be countering some of our adversaries in the world, whether that's Russia, China has realized this has been a very priority and that's why they've really invested heavily in, in their diplomacy programs. And we need to catch up or, or at least make an effort to close the gap on what they're spending on there. Because if we're not, if Fulbright is not there, China's there and they got those countries ears and the people there on their priorities, which are, as we know, not US priorities in diplomacy. And then also just the realistic on, on post pandemic, Congress is all still focusing on pandemic, um, the issues there. There's obviously, as everyone knows, uh, traveling, working countries, the testing and all the other requirements on PPE. So that's uh, why these, re these are current things that Congress is very focused on that we're trying to say, this is how Fulbright can help to address these issues that Congress, that you're focused on, that you're prioritizing. And that's why the Fulbright program and, and this funding is very, very critical um, to fund it at the 403 level. Sarah, your comments on why you think this would resonate uh, on Capitol Hill particularly, because finding, finding that resonance is, is so important uh, to, to, to a, a bipartisan approach to this effort. You're exactly right, John, and building on what Lauren said, I think what we did when we were talking about this slide 
amongst you know our smaller group was okay how do we make sure that we're very um, impactful with our messaging on why this money is needed since we are asking for such a big increase inflation is on everybody's lips i mean in inside and outside dc this is like a very important issue that people really understand from on a personal level but then also people in dc when they're talking when they're thinking through policy they're also thinking about that and so we the 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 notion of um purchasing power lost inflation is a very relevant one um and so we're simply translating that to what it means for for, for for diplomacy as well. I mean, it's it's you know it's 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 impacting us you know every day um, to and from work or the store, but then also our place in the world. And then also um, another another thing that people are very you know thinking about <coughs> the through line through a lot of different um, pieces of legislation, a lot of different policies, and that's one of um, diversity and that that means racial diversity yes but it also means the type of people that are participating in this so someone in the comments made a comment about what about those with children or families i mean clearly they have different um, expense calculation than a young single person with means so you talk about um um diversity of age uh, we don't want only young people that are single because we want people that are maybe older have families in their perspective to be out in the world as well. Um, we want people that come from um, people like we don't want to exclude people simply because they can't afford to participate and they perhaps are highly qualified and um, are the you know perfect ambassador for us. I mean, ambassador small a. <laughs> For, for the country out in the world. And so there are ways that we can meaningfully change the makeup of the applicants and those accepted to the program. And frankly, that is money. And we make it easier for those kinds of people to participate. So I think um, I was noticing, you know, I'm, I, I, I hope that I look younger than I am, but you know, I'm a um, 40 something with four small children and that really impacts the way, like the things that I choose to spend my time. And I notice a lot of us on this call are more experienced at life as well. And so I think that there's a there's a perspective that we can bring that we want to allow others like us to participate in this program more fully as well. One more dimension to, uh, to diversity is geographic and institutional diversity, right? So you don't want to just send people from the East and West Coast you want to send folks from rural areas. You want us to be fully representative of who we are as Americans. You can only do that if you devote the resources to finding these people, recruiting these people, supporting them, and then eventually giving them a grant they can afford to take. A final point on this slide is to tell your stories that illustrate those messages. So you're making the ask, but you're also adding that personal dimension to this, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's not all about budgetary numbers. It's about personal connection. A few tips for success, and again, Lauren and Sarah have a lot of success on Capitol Hill, so they'll add to this. I'll I'll list a couple of these. Um, the first is to keep your roles clear. Uh, as you will hear from us later this week, um, uh, you'll get assignments to a team. Some of you will be designated as team leaders. Those of you who have had more experience doing this, many of you have volunteered to be leaders and we really appreciate that. But if that is not your role, keep that in mind, your team leader will take this role to orchestrate things, to uh, introduce people, keep the conversation moving, make the ask and so on. So clarify, who who is doing what and that's the reason why meeting in advance which we'll talk about in a minute is so important second point keep this very positive and nonpartisan. critically important that our appeal uh, work with both sides of the hill and both sides of the aisle um, that's that's very important we have friends uh on everywhere on capitol hill we want to keep it that way uh, for example at the fulbright prize we had, uh, a, we had almost 20 members of Congress attend in person. Half of them were Republicans, including the minority whip of the House, Steve Scalise. So it's really important that we maintain that reputation and messaging. 
keep it short. One of the things I've, I've attended maybe hundreds of these meetings with Fulbrighters. It's really important that you try to keep yourself disciplined in your storytelling. I know you want to tell that story more fully, but time is critical and you want to keep it disciplined. And finally, remember that you're on Zoom. So think about the background, think about whether you're, you can be heard well, uh, whether the lighting on you is good enough. Uh, so there's some technical things that you want to keep in mind. Okay, um, we'll go and reverse this, Sarah and then Lauren, any other suggestions for how to make this, this kind of meeting uh, successful? Uh, I think um, a couple points. I think, like John said, I think the most difficult thing for most people, and I will include myself in that, is that discipline in keeping the message and the story tight. It's so easy when, especially when someone is on um, the other side of the table, this, in this case, it'll be the proverbial table, is interested in what you're saying. And it's you tempting to want to tell them more, 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 more. But I think we really have to pull ourselves back and realize we probably only have a half an hour scheduled for this. And you're talking about a lot of different things and you want to keep it really, really tight. Um, give them succinct answers. I think another thing is it's, it's easy to try to build camaraderie with the staffer by discussing um, politics, just even a small talk. And I'll be the first to tell you politics is my job. I obviously like it enough to do it professionally. And so I talk about it all day long, but really what you're there for is to talk about the specific um, issue in front of us, which is the appropriations ask for the Fulbright program. And so what may seem like an innocent sort of, um, Remark, even if you think it's positive, is just for this context is not appropriate. So we don't talk about like, oh, I hope your boss wins or can't wait to see them back or work with them next time, you know, that sort of thing. It just leave it out. Um, if you want to talk shop, you can give us a call. We'll talk about it all day. We love it. <laughs> so I would say those are the two. I think um, working with um, people that are that are coming in, um, in this case, virtually from out of town, those are the two, I think, things that we we try to be really good about but that's that's often the the two most common challenges that i see yeah and i just want to also take uh echo uh sarah and what john's comments on on giving short um obviously depending on the group size um everyone's going to want to talk and speak and that's great problem is um these staffers these meetings are going to be maybe schedule a half hour they may about 15, 20 minutes because they're going to have meetings probably on both sides of these. So they may have to jump off, say, I got a meeting in a couple of minutes. So we want to get our points across a story short, but we also want to allow the time. The, the staffers are going to feel like it was a productive meeting. And what's going to be very helpful to you is you're, you're getting this understanding, but you also want to hear their questions or maybe concerns that they've heard or their or the senator or, or their representative that they work for because those are valuable that gives you insights on what they're hearing or concerns they've had about the program that either you're going to be able to supply the answer or if not just say you know i'm a fulbrighter i'm um let me i'm going to get your question and then we'll um, follow up from the associate someone from the fulbright association can follow up with that question on there and that's perfectly fine to do but you do want that interaction with the staffers uh, because you're going to get that information from them but they're also going to want to have an input if they're just sitting there for 30 minutes listening to stories they're probably going to uh, maybe tune out after maybe 15 20 minutes if they haven't had a, had a chance to interact or have a question or or raise uh any concerns or or have or be able to make a comment about that. I'll tell a quick story to illustrate this. Uh, most of our meetings will be, as Sarah and Lauren have suggested, with staff members. So you shouldn't be disappointed if you're not meeting with the principal, which is, which is quite rare. But on one occasion, we did have a senator come uh, as part of the meeting. And one person in that meeting kind of rambled on and on. And then the senator had to leave before we had a chance to make a number of the po critical points. So it was exciting to have the senator uh, in the meeting, and, but this person got a little carried away and there was no way to cut her off. It just went on too long and then we lost that opportunity. So 
again, try to be disciplined. Um, a few comments in the chat. I just didn't know if you wanted to try to hit some of them while we're on this. Some of them are relevant for. Sure, go, go ahead. Uh, go ahead and read them if you could. Um, so I think um, there's, a, there's been a couple questions about numbers in terms of what are the numbers of um, Fulbright grantees? Um, how does that track with like, you know, last year, the year before, and maybe like a historical number before mm. the cut. Um, because I think people want to make sure like, okay, if I'm advocating for this increase, like what's that going for? And then there's also a question about the things that we, um, we're talking about improving the program, whether it's um, increasing the grant size, that sort of thing. Are we aligned with the program itself in what that additional money would be going towards? Yeah. So this is where the left hand does not always know what the right hand is doing. Um, so one of the challenges that we have as an organization separate from the State Department is that we do not have access to all the numbers that they have at any given time. The other problem is that the, uh, the, uh, there has not been an annual report on the program for a number of years. So the numbers can be um, hard to come by. Let me just keep it simple. Um, there are basically 8,000 Fulbright grants a year. Half of them are for inbound scholars and students, and the other half, the 4,000, are outbound students. You can just keep that 8,000 figure in mind, half and half. That will help because, again, you want to keep this simple, and you want to emphasize that this is an exchange program where those 4,000 visiting Fulbrighters are spending their grants in communities all across America. So keep that simple. Um, as to where the money would go specifically, um, we are encouraging um, uh, the spending of monies in commission-driven countries. In other words, there are 49 countries that are administered by commissions. And we uh, believe that those programs need um, more financial investment. But my suggestion is that you keep, as best you can, keep away from the details on this. Um, it's, uh, it gets complicated and it, uh, it, it turns out to not be particularly helpful. Sticking with the messaging rather than the specifics of how it will be administered really helps. We'll get to more questions um, when we're done, and we only have one or two more slides, so let's knock them out. Um, as you end the meeting, you'll want to thank them for their time, their attention, and their public service. We always thank staffers for their gift of their energy and talent to all of us, regardless of uh, their partisan bent. Uh, they are public servants, and they work very hard for all of us. Um, Ask them if, and this is a critical question, is there any further information that you need to help uh, support this $403 million request? That's a straight up question. So what, you know, what information do you need? What stories do you need? What data do you need? And then you can relay that to our office through the advocacy uh, email. Um, Generally, they will say, no, I've got everything I need, and that's fine, and that's good. You don't want to press them on that, um, but uh, it also shows that you want to be a continuing resource to them. And then finally, uh, I thank them for their support uh, of the Fulbright program. Okay, um, one more slide, and then I'm going to turn to Fiona, who's going to talk about next steps. Um, the first is that after your meeting, the leader, not everybody, but just the leader of the, pro of the team needs to fill out a meeting report form. This is just to be sure that we know who you've met with, how it went, whether there was any follow-up needed, etc. If you can, post to social media. Um, you can take screenshots uh, of these uh, experiences and post them to your own accounts and, and use these hashtags, stand for Fulbright and hashtag Fulbright. If you wanna do the extra effort, you can hashtag that member's office so that you can thank them for meeting with you in support of 
the Fulbright program and their social media people will see that if you hashtag their office. And finally, uh, offer them a thank you note. Now, everybody can do that, not just the leader. Everybody can write a thank you note. It's always gracious to, to uh, show your appreciation. Okay, so let's, let's go to uh, Fiona. You're go oh, wait a minute, that didn't work. Let me go forward. Go, go ahead, Fiona. Sure, so just what you can expect to receive in the coming days, everyone will be notified by email, not just the leaders, um, but everyone can expect to receive a list of their appointment or appointments, um, including the time uh, with the staffer's name that you'll be meeting with. It'll also include information as to whether it's a Zoom or a conference call, all of that technical information will be there. Um, you'll in, uh, also receive PDFs of our ask, um, of our messaging, frequently asked questions, um, not just for the staffer, but for you as well. Um, it'll include a list of the members that you'll be advocating with um, and the leader of the group. Uh, it will also include a link to this session. Uh, it, it's been recorded and uh, you'll get a link uh, to uh, the recording, including uh, this presentation. Um, and then finally, there'll be uh, a link for the Fulbright Association virtual Zoom background, if that's something you're interested in. Um, I know people like to have backgrounds sometimes, and it's nice to have a little bit of branding to familiarize the staffer. Okay, great. Uh, so for team leaders, um, when you receive this information, uh, reach out to the other members of your group and try and coordinate on messaging and stories. Uh, we advise that best rule of thumb is to prepare as far ahead of time as possible. Um, it's important that the group meet ahead of time before you meet with these congressional offices, just so that you know procedurally um, how you're going to approach these meetings, what stories you're going to tell, and make sure that all of the points of these messaging um, components are uh, well prepared for uh, making sure everyone gets to speak and everyone gets to say their piece. So as organized as you can be, um, as ahead of time as possible is always the best way to approach these. Um, tech, some little technical points. Um, make sure that you're on the call a little bit early. It doesn't have to be that early, um, but just to make sure that you have no technical issues or anything, make sure your cameras are working um, and your microphones are working, everything like that. If you have any issues, uh, you're always welcome to send our office uh, a, an email or call our office. All that information will be in the materials. Uh, that you're sent as well in the coming days. Um, and generally uh, direct your questions to advocacy at fulbright.org, um, not just about the meetings, but about anything in general. If you have any questions after uh, this presentation uh, today or in, in the next week, you're also free to send an email there at any time. We'll be monitoring that pretty closely over the next month or so. So we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Fiona. It, um, do do um, practice patience. Uh, it, uh, putting these meetings together is complicated because there are lots of moving parts to it. Um, so uh, do be patient. Uh, also note that we're doing our best to respect your time. So you have been giving us some preferences or blackout times that you can't generally participate. It's of course possible that will come back to you with a time that's not convenient to you. And we apologize for that. We hope you'll do some adjusting to your personal calendar if you can in order to attend. But if for some reason you cannot attend, um, then uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. We're doing our best to accommodate everyone. Let me go now to um, uh, our Q&A section. So let me uh, turn off the share here so everybody can see everyone. You're welcome to put your uh, video uh, back on so we can see your wonderful faces. Um, I think I see a question from Lauren Hershey. Go ahead, Lauren. John, thanks very much. Uh, it's really an excellent presentation for all of us. I've done this Thank a you. few other times. Uh, one question, I'm fascinated by this um, possibility that there's a list of ministers or uh, government officials. Um, 
So I, I don't know if that is something that can be generated. Uh, particularly yeah, you know, Lauren, I, in critical places. I have. Yeah. I have now, hold on, wait. And, and the second part is university presidents or provosts or deans in foreign countries. And it may be that you can't gather this up for this cycle, but it might be useful in future cycles. No, that's, uh, a, that's, that's a, a, a superb suggestion. We're working on that. One of the problems is this is so decentralized we would be relying on commissions primarily to assemble those lists, but we will definitely take, uh, take note of that suggestion. Thank you. Um, and uh, last question, uh, I'm sorry, uh, all 50 states do get Fulbrighters or not? Do yes, you know for as, a, as a general rule, there are some times when a state may not, but for the, for the most part, the State Department does a really great job of uh, spreading out the the benefits of the Fulbright program, uh, it's it's a work in progress because uh, a lot of visiting Fulbrighters they want to go to the famous universities, to the Ivy Leagues, to certain institutions. They don't want to be put in to at you know at a smaller college in Oklahoma or Nebraska. Uh, so there's a a bit of give and take there. But uh, as a general rule, yes, they are everywhere. Other, I'll, other I'll add a, if I can add a point to that as well, um, those uh, documents that will be sent to you as uh, per the Fulbright impact per state, uh, those documents also include uh, the institutions within that state uh, that have the greatest recipients, uh, the greatest number of Fulbrighters visiting. Um, those documents are all about the impact economically and socially culturally of the uh, Fulbright program. So there's information in those documents if you're curious. Uh, let's see, Anne, go ahead. Uh, yes, um, I have a couple other questions in the chat, but John, as we've chosen to mention the commissions and the strength of those alliances, uh, rather than perhaps the whole number of countries that participate, um, I think we might add a few more words regarding those commissions that also contribute financially to the program and the importance of those countries who have bought into the binational nature of the program rather than just the fact that we have an alliance. Yeah, and that's an excellent point and an overlooked point uh, from earlier. Thanks for the correction. Yes, the, um, the fact is that these other countries collectively donate another hundred million dollars to the program. This is a point that uh, we've made for many years but somehow is always new and surprising to members of Congress. Uh, they basically say, wait a minute, are you suggesting that this program is leveraged uh, or is leveraging more monies from foreign governments? And the answer is yes. It's quite unique in that, in that, in that feature uh, and, and a very important point to make. A further point to make is that those same countries who have been basically carrying uh, the weight of this program for the last 12 years are expecting America to show financial leadership, not just programmatic leadership. So they're saying like, where is your, what's happened to your contribution? Um, there are many countries in which the foreign, the, 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 that government is outspending the United States for this, for an American program. Mm. It's quite outrageous, um, but very common. Jay, you have a comment. Yeah, question. yeah. Thanks for the great conversation, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, just fine. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Geopolitically disconnected, poor countries need Fulbrighters. The investment in those countries. So I'm a beneficiary. Well, also I'm continuing to work with Kazakhstan and Mongolia. They, they don't have a commissions, but Thailand has commissions. I still work with all three of them. But I think uh, that that one aspect uh, maybe uh, will add to the conversation. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. So, uh, but you gotta sort of, you gotta pick your message, right? So this, yeah. in this particular cycle, we're tending to emphasize those countries that are in alliances with the United States. That's mm -hmm. an especially topical message. It's certainly true that countries that are not central to, to that effort 
or important. I'm not suggesting that. But right now, they're paying attention to messaging around alliances and um, and their uh, work. Um, okay. So that's so uh, that's mid next that. cycle. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Um, other questions. Um, if if there are those who are reading the chat that could help me, I haven't had a chance to look through all the questions. Anything um, One that there? We answer, John, is, Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, the timing of when this all matters. So we're going to do these meetings. And then the question is, when are these members of Congress going to be voting on um, this? And I think that it might help just to do like a very quick overview of the whole appropriations process. So what happens is that um, groups like ours and other companies, private, public, they, um, nonprofit, for-profit, they're making requests of members of Congress for whatever it is that, that they're looking for. It can be um, um, a specific project that they brought back earmarks, which are more directed spending. Um, but then there's also these regular appropriations and that's what we're talking about here. So groups and um, companies make requests of these members. They um, then, if they agree, they will submit that to the um, appropriations subcommittee that's relevant for um, what the request is. Then the subcommittee takes that under consideration and that subcommittee will decide, um, are they going to include it in their subcommittee bill? And then those bills are then um, either voted on this, we've seen this the past couple of years, like, We've seen individual subcommittee bills move through the regular order process. We've seen them sort of combined all together into these omnibus um, appropriations bills. So this is, we're still kind of on the, the front end of the overall appropriations process with these meetings. And then they'll continue on through the spring and in the summer, and then they'll have to, Congress will have to do something by September 30th whether that's just extend the current funding through a continuing resolution or a CR, or um, by passing either the bills um, individually or as part of an omnibus. I think Lauren and I are probably betting on another continuing resolution. Um, that'll happen probably September 30th, if I had to <laughs> make a guess, but sometime in September, that will kick um, funding, government funding through the election, through the beginning of November. And then at some point between the election and the start of the new Congress, which is the very beginning of January of next year, they will fund the government somehow. And um, if history it teaches us anything, it'll probably be right around the holidays in December um, that will, you know, they'll decide that they want to go home. And that's when we'll, we'll come to an agreement. Um, but anyway, that's sort of the timeline and the pacing of all of this. So we're on the front end. We're right on time for all of this. Thank and, you, Sarah. And I think it's particular timely is that the uh, the House Appropriations Committee has announced kind of their schedule. They are looking at marking up all, there's all 12 appropriations bills, which the Fulbright program comes under the state foreign ops. The uh, second or the uh, at the end of May with the full committee markups, at the end of May, with we'll tee it up for possibly bringing those bills to the floor in June or July. Other priorities may come up there, but that's in the House. So that's why getting this message is very timely at there. The Senate, they haven't released their schedule on when they're going to start um, considering appropriations. But as Sarah said, people have been, they've already been collecting requests and all that. So the timing is actually, we're in the front end in a good timing spot for our advocacy for the Fulbright program. I'd add, I'd add one thing and then I'll have a, a couple practical summaries and then we'll, we'll end this, uh, this workshop. Um, by the way, if you have continuing questions, you're welcome to direct them to advocacy at Fulbright.org. Uh, as Fiona mentioned, we'll, we're monitoring that every minute so we can, we're happy to answer your question. One thing I'd like to say is that the Fulbright Prize, as I just mentioned, was a, an extraordinary step forward in our advocacy strategy. I mentioned that we had nearly 20 members of Congress in the room. That means that all those principles that you often don't get to see during meetings like the ones we'll do in May were there with us for hours. The chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Pat Leahy, sat with us for three hours 
thinking about and talking about Fulbright. The chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, was with us for the whole time and was so excited about it. Uh, she talked to everyone. She talked to me. She wants to be helpful to Fulbright. This was wonderful, but it's really important. The, what, the work you're doing is spreading that news, uh, the, the, sorry, the message about the Fulbright program to both appropriators and those who are not on the committee who will be making important votes. So uh, working at the leadership level and the rank and file level, critically important. A couple of quick summary. Uh, Again, in the next couple of days, you'll be looking for an email from us assigning you to a team. You'll want to meet in advance uh, and uh, get yourselves coordinated. Again, we'll be getting that to you as quickly as we can. Please, please be patient. Um, these meetings will take place scattered over the month of May. There's not a one day or another day that we're doing advocacy. So um, again, try to be as flexible as you can be. Remember to share your experiences with us. Tell us how it went. Um, we want to learn from it, and we want to be sure that we've learned uh, what you've done. I want to thank you all very, very much for doing advocacy. It's a critical part of our, our mission, and you guys are really good at this. I mean, uh, last year I sat in on many meetings. It was so inspiring uh, your storytelling makes a big difference. You're doing something really important for today's Fulbrighters and the next generation of Fulbrighters. I can't be more grateful than I am to our advocates. Um, again, uh, stay in touch with us. If you have any questions or concerns, we're happy to answer them. And we hope you have a, a great day and a great experience. Thank you for joining. And also thank you to Lauren Aho and Sarah Donovan for joining us from Venable. Your expertise makes all the difference. Thank you very much. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Take care. Thank you, John and Fiona, especially too. Thank You're you. You're most welcome. Thank you, Bob. All right. Take care, everybody. Be safe.